For 60 years, the people in Waukesha, Wisconsin have been celebrating the beginning of the holiday season with an annual Christmas parade. Winding through the main street of downtown, this parade features marching bands, floats, and of course, a special appearance from the big guy himself, Santa. It's a small town tradition shared by the young and old. But last year, that parade was transformed from an innocent family tradition to the scene of a mass murder. Little eight-year-old Jackson Sparks was the youngest murder victim, and 81-year-old Wilhelm Hospel was the oldest. Four others lost their lives that day, and more than 60 others were injured. How did this wonderful community event turn into such a violent scene? Prosecutors say it is this felon who is responsible. They say he drove his car into the parade route, taking out innocent people. Tonight, we are live in Waukesha as the community prepares for another holiday season and another parade, while they also prepare for the trial of the man they say destroyed it all last year. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And what a tragedy out in Waukesha. You know, when you, when you talk about this country of ours, there are so many communities and, and, and small towns that have traditions from coast to coast. You know, times of the year where the, the, the community comes together and engages in whatever that holiday is, whatever that event is. And it's a big part of what this nation is about. It's about your neighbors. It's about generation to generation sharing of traditions. And we have so many of them uh, in small towns throughout this country. You know, the town I grew up in, in New Jersey, West Orange, New Jersey, the, the, the one day of the year that everyone got together, regardless of whether or not you're Irish, was St. Patrick's Day. Because the West Orange, New Jersey, St. Patrick's Day parade was a tradition in our town. And everyone gathered and you know, if whoever was the master of ceremonies, it was sort of a big deal, but it was young kids, their parents, their parents' parents, generations getting together for a really simple, wholesome celebration. But if you've ever been to a parade and you see the eyes on the little kids, it's just amazing. And to be able to share that with them, it's such a big, big part, uh, uh, again, of what the fabric of this country is about. Now, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, the, the tradition, the big tradition there for this wonderful small town was, was the Christmas parade. And, and think, about, think about that. It was a way to kick off the holiday season. And they would do it kind of early in November, um, usually before Thanksgiving. And it was like, okay, it's, it's that time of year again. And it's, it's that time of year again to share it with the folks who've been there for many, many years and the folks who may be the young ones who are going for the very first time and getting to see, um, you know, waiting for the big guy at the end, but getting to see friends and folks from town marching down that street. And sometimes maybe you would get to march and, and be a part of the Christmas parade. Such, you know, you look at it and say it's such a simple event, but it's so important and, and such a part of the experience and part of being in that community. And then you go back to last year and you think about the mass destruction that one man has been accused of putting on this community. He's been accused of, of taking an SUV and purposely driving it into the parade route striking children, striking senior citizens, the dancing grannies who were a tradition in that parade, all that mass destruction. And it's all one person, six dead, more than 60 injured, and who knows how many have been traumatized by what happened less than a year ago in what should have been a just another wonderful day in Waukesha, a wonderful family experience where the community can come together and say, hey, it's time to begin the most wonderful time of the year. 
and it became the most awful night of the year. For those of you who don't know the story, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has it for us tonight. It was November 21st, 2021. Thousands of people were gathered in downtown Waukesha, Wisconsin for the annual Christmas parade. But an afternoon of holiday cheer turned into a tragic nightmare. Police say this man deliberately drove his SUV into the parade. It increases its speed and it begins to do a zigzagging motion through the crowd, hitting people, running people over, and it appears that the vehicle's intentionally aiming for people. The alleged driver, Darrell Brooks, drove through the parade route for five blocks, driving up to 25 miles per hour while plowing into parade goers and participants. Detective Thomas Casey was working that day and testified about what he saw at a pre-trial hearing. I first stepped in front of the SUV, um, put my hands up, and was yelling for the vehicle to stop. Okay. Did the vehicle stop? It did not. It first hits the drum player, it continues, and I would say it hits approximately 10 people and runs directly over the top of them and then turns to the right and starts hitting other people in the parade route. Dozens of people were hit. Six people died from multiple blunt force injuries, including an eight-year-old boy, and 61 others were injured. Faith in you. These families are going through a really hard time. Everybody that was here just went through such trauma. According to the criminal complaint, the driver slowed down only to then accelerate taking an abrupt left turn directly into a crowd. This, investigators say, showed an intentional act to strike and hurt as many people as possible. The driver didn't stop until a police officer shot at him. One of our officers saw the vehicle coming at him and forced that officer to discharge his service weapon. He fired at Mr. Brooks' vehicle? Yes, he did. Did he strike the vehicle? Three times. Did the vehicle stop? Did not. Brooks eventually drove into a nearby neighborhood, crashed his car, and then took off on foot. He stopped at this house where a ring camera captured the moment police caught up with him. Brooks was arrested and charged with dozens of criminal acts, including six counts of first degree intentional homicide. Interrogation records from that night show Brooks told police that he, quote, didn't mean to kill anyone. Brooks pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but withdrew that plea in September. Have you had the opportunity to thoroughly discuss your decision to withdraw your special plea with your attorneys? Yeah. Have they discussed the advantages and disadvantages of withdrawing that plea with you? Yeah. I, I have my own reasons why. Just a week before trial, yet another twist in the case. Brooks decided he would represent himself, prompting his defense attorneys to withdraw. At a hearing, the judge ruled Brooks competent and not to represent himself, but his actions in court are raising questions. I object to that. Responses I object to questions to that. asked. I object to that, that because his, at the end of I the understand day, you, Mr. Brooks, I object, stop. You can object. object. Your objection is noted. I'm going on. I, this is one I of object. the expectations that I have is you can object. It will be noted but you can't keep interrupting. You're, you're your reading objection, from something, sir, your objection you're reading is from noted. something that I haven't been privileged this to read myself. This is a prime myself. example of some of the difficulty uh, with Mr. Brooks. I don't think you have a PhD, um, He Your can Honor. be, dis in my opinion, deliberately disruptive, but nonetheless, he maintains being competent at the most basic level in order to present a defense on his uh, behalf. Check to that. Brooks' mother pleaded with the court not to allow him to represent himself. She says she won't be at the trial and expects her son will be out of control. And I hate to say this, you're going to see manic, full-blown. That's what you're going to see. All right, let's bring in Core TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who is live tonight in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Chanley, great to see you. Um, let's start, let's go back in time. Let's talk about 
this parade and what this parade is all about and what happened last year. Well, Vinny, like you mentioned earlier, this was a 60-year tradition to hold the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade on the Sunday before Thanksgiving in picturesque downtown. I was there last night on your show, and it's a beautiful place to be. It's out of like a Hallmark movie. I mean, it's a community that, I think this is from 2019, the parade. They did not hold it in 2020 because of COVID, so that increase the anticipation for the 2021 parade uh, last year. People were really looking forward to it. It's on a Sunday. Thousands descended upon downtown Waukesha. Again, it's just a Milwaukee suburb. And it began around 4 o'clock in the evening. 100 participating groups from local businesses, dance associations, sport teams, faith assemblies. They were all decked out, uh, ready to celebrate this holiday tradition. And for blocks, as you can see there, police uh, squad cars uh, barricade the roads. They have actual barricades uh, blocking the parade route down East Main Street where I was last night. And that was what happened, what you kind of see there for about 30 to 40 minutes, Vinny. And it wasn't until about 40 minutes into this annual holiday celebration where a loud honking of a horn drew the attention of parade goers and of a detective there and they this red SUV just blew through the barricades and started to wreak havoc for five blocks. Uh, horror and chaos ensued. This SUV, according to police, reached speeds up to 25 miles per hour as it mowed through parade marchers from behind, spectators uh, who were watching with their families. And it would not stop uh, mercilessly just running through the crowds. One eyewitness said it was like the SUV was trying to avoid vehicles, not people. There was no attempt made to stop uh, or much less slow down is what one witness told police. And it, there was one point in the criminal complaint where a police officer, Vinny, says that there was one time the SUV uh, uh, slowed or the brakes uh, were uh, engaged, but only for a second before it accelerated rapidly to the left where the tires squealed. It, it accelerated so fast into directly into a group of people, the crowd. And that's what the police say shows an intentional act to mow down, hurt as many people as possible. And earlier today, we actually made this route. Uh, we outlined it, of course, on a map where the parade began, uh, which and we, we drove the video here to show you. We started Frame uh, Frame Park is the location where Brooks was allegedly in this altercation with his ex-girlfriend. He leaves the park onto White Oak Avenue, which goes directly into the staging area at that time of the parade, then turned left. That's where the police officer right there says he tried to pound on the hood to stop the car, but it kept going down East Main Street, as we see right now. That's this five city blocks uh, and continued to wreak havoc through the crowd for about a third of the mile before exiting only when an officer towards the end of the parade route shot at the SUV three times. That was the only reason it left that and, of course, fled uh, down to a nearby neighborhood, Benny. Yeah, looking at that footage, wow. I mean, it, it, even though it's probably pretty cold, you know, that time of year, people are showing up and, and really trying to get into the spirit of the season. Chanley Painter in, in Wisconsin in Waukesha tonight. Um, uh, we're going to speak with you a little bit later in the program. I want to bring in another guest uh, joining us in Waukesha as the host of the radio show this week in Waukesha on WAUK Radio 940 AM. Former alderman for the 1st District of Waukesha Common Council and was present at this parade. Uh, Don Paul Brown is joining us. Don, thanks so much uh, for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Glad um, to be here. Let, let's start first, and, and I want people to understand what this tradition was and what this parade was about. Before we get to what happened last year, let's talk about what happened, you know, the, the 59 years before that, when the folks in Waukesha would get together. Um, how important was this parade? Who would participate? And, and what was it really all about? You know, um, all of our children used to participate with their teams or, you know, one daughter danced. Um, my wife used to um, march in it with the team, with, with one of the kids' teams as a parent. It was a big, um, it was a big deal. And um, when I became uh, an alderman, you know, my first chance to participate was actually last year. And um, 
well, it's I was in the front of the parade and it was actually a very special event. You know, I my experience of the parade was entirely different than what most of the world witnessed. There was um, it was very multi generational. There were different family, you know, different families, people from just about every demographic there, uh, wishing each other happy holidays, Merry Christmas, so many good tidings, and it's always like very cold. But in spite of that, the people come out, and, and it's a really great celebration and a really great way to kick off the holiday season. Yeah, I mean, that speaks volumes because super cold, but you know what? We're going to get together, and we're going to share the warmth of each yeah. other. And, and, and to me, tell me a little bit about Waukesha, too. I've never, never been out there. What's, what's that community about? It's a historic city. It's, it's home to the uh, oldest uh, university in Wisconsin, which is Carroll University. It's the home of Les Paul, so there's, there's still a great guitar tradition here in downtown. Uh, it's the uh, <laughs> the birthplace of the first forward pass in, in, in college football or pro football <laughs> at Carroll University. There's a lot of great history. There's a very vibrant downtown that's been revitalized within the last 10 years. Um, a lot of eclectic restaurants and, and bars and, and um, uh, great shops. Uh, there, there's three high schools here and a diocesan uh, Catholic high school here. Uh, it's the most diverse city in Waukesha County. It's also the county seat. And so uh, there's just, there's a lot going on here. Uh, we've, my family's lived here for uh, for 10 years now. We loved it. Uh, my kids love the, the schools, the friends that they've made. We have a wonderful park system. Working for the city and having lived in other cities, uh, the government is extremely well run. It's run very efficiently and the services are second to none. And I've, I've lived in Chicago, I've lived in Washington, DC, I've lived in um, Michigan, Western New York. So, so tell I've me this, Don, you know, what you described is what, you know, a bunch of people want to move there right now, right? After the way you describe it. So tell me- yeah, the, if you can it, handle the winners. <laughs> exactly. But tell me the impact yeah. of what happened last year and how this community, community reacted and, and, and what it meant as we get ready for this trial to begin. Sure. You know, I um, obviously very tragic, but also moments of great um, pride and embrace. The community's really come together. They've embraced uh, the families of the victims. Um, that, and that includes those who were severely injured, too. And, um, you know, the, the whole city, it's still filled with blue light bulbs and, and, and so many houses. Um, people, you know, don't want to forget uh, those that we lost and those that were impacted. Um, my son had two uh, friends they played baseball with that were in the marching band and uh, were, were very severely injured. And, and they've been a beacon of hope. Um, they both were able to play baseball last spring, um, Tyler Pudliner and Eric Teagues. And um, what happened that day to them you know what we we really and and to many of these people that were hit we we weren't sure there was really a lot of um people were scared we weren't sure what the outcome would be and to see these young men and so many others bounce back in the way that they have um has been truly inspiring for um so many of us here in waukesha and that's why you, you hear a lot of waukesha strong and it really is true and so i, I think we've come together as a community the Waukesha South basketball team won the Conference 8 championship, the toughest athletic conference in the state uh, for the first time in 20 years this past season. And that, that gave this town something to feel really good about. And so we um, we continue to move forward. The, the Waukesha Blazers, that's where the uh, young Jackson Sparks was part of that baseball club. They have um, started a baseball tournament in his honor. And uh, they're also, um, they're using one of our, um, they're building a Jackson Sparks Memorial Stadium for youth baseball. And so, um, you know, we, we've really come together as a community. There's a memorial uh, commission that was set up by the mayor and, and, and the city. And there's going to be, they're going to be developing a, a memorial, you know, different treatments for downtown so that we never forget what happened here. And um, one of my last acts as alderman was I voted in favor of a, of a barricade. And, um, you know, it was a big budget, but certainly justifiable. And it's, We've had two parades since then, Memorial Day and Fourth of July, that were very successful and very safe so that we can ensure that uh, this type of thing doesn't happen again. 
Absolutely. So we, you know, we continue to move forward, but we don't forget those that we lost. And, and yeah, and the pain is still there. It's going to be a long time before it goes away. It may never go away, but uh, we've really found a lot of strength in each other. Absolutely. And we're looking at a picture of the vic victims, and the one all the way to the right is Jackson Sparks, the little guy you've been talking yeah. about. Don, you're such a great spokesperson uh, for that community, uh, and you really painted a very vivid picture for us. And, and we thank you for your time, and the best to you and all your neighbors out there in Waukesha. Thanks so much for having me on. Have a great night. All right. When we come back, folks, um, we're going to talk about some of the victims who may have to testify in this case. We're talking about young victims, teenagers, preteens. What's been the impact on them? We'll talk about that. Plus, coming up in the next hour. In Bismarck, North Dakota, Nikki Ensel accused of cheating on her husband and then murdering him tonight. All the evidence is in and the arguments have been made and it's time for the jury to speak. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action do make the following finding regarding the defendant, Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel. Love triangle with a tragic ending. Nikki Ensel is accused of killing her husband. Her boyfriend pled guilty for his part. Now she's facing a jury and life in prison if convicted. The cheating wife murder trial. Weekday mornings only on Court TV. How often do you hear of a mom being shot by a killer dressed as a clown? She killed my daughter and he marries her. Unbelievable. A clown at the door. Sunday night, 9 8 Central. Only on Court. After the Waukesha Christmas Parade tragedy and Daryl Brooks's trial is underway. What kind of trauma could these victims' children be experiencing right now? They might um, feel sweaty palms. Their heart might be beating really fast. Some of them might struggle with sleeping. Lakeisha Russell, a licensed counselor, says those feelings will only be heightened with victims answering Brooks's questions as he represents himself. You know, if it's a younger subset of kids, so like maybe eight and, and below, it might be harder for them to understand why am I being questioned by him. If they're a little older, they might have a better understanding. Russell says the best way to prepare a child to testify is to have them practice telling what happened before they have to do it in court, a practice she calls narrative therapy. So oftentimes, them resharing and recounting that story can help desensitize those triggering traumatic experiences that they might be feeling. She believes the impact of going before the man accused of killing six and injuring dozens of others can lead to bigger problems for the children if they're not addressed now. Paul Booker served as the Waukesha County District Attorney for more than two decades and believes Brooks will not be allowed to approach witnesses or victims. Booker believes he'll have to question them while seated. It's emotional, it's difficult, but you have to get them ready for it. We have to acknowledge how they're feeling because they're the ones experiencing that. We can't take away that experience from them. The most important part for Russell is ensuring these young children have the support in place before, during, and after they take the stand. What does healing look like after that child takes the stand? Healing looks like them being able to share their story and not being triggered by sharing their story. Uba Ali, TMJ4 News. Big thanks to our affiliate WTMJ for that report. And that's a, a, a part of this case. A lot of these victims are children, young children. Many of them may have to come into the courtroom and testify. Let's bring in our expert joining us in uh, New York City, psychotherapist, host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Dr. Robbie, great to see you tonight. Um, this is going to be difficult. The, the Number one, it's not just about reliving, it's about they're going to be questioned and cross-examined by the man who prosecutors and investigators say actually did it. That's going to be tough. Yeah, and it's an unusual circumstance because most defendants don't defend themselves, right? They have lawyers. Clearly, this person is manic, 
and dysregulated. So it's really unclear anything can come out of his mouth. But I do agree with the experts that were interviewed. The best thing that we can do for these kids is remind them of the purpose, the why behind why they're doing this. They are the voice of the victim. And they are there to share their story and help put somebody who is bad behind bars. And to practice that story ahead of time so that it feels as natural as possible and people who are knowledgeable can prepare these kids for some of the questions that might be asked of them. But a reminder that they are part of the legal process for good and that their voice is valuable and to provide counseling not only before they testify, but afterwards to see how they're feeling after they shared their story in court to make sure they aren't vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder and that people are available to provide them with the support that they need. How about the children who were at that parade who maybe weren't struck but witnessed what happened? It's starting to get cold again. We're just over a month away from that parade in Waukesha. Do you think those children who were there last year, maybe witnessed this, should go back to the parade this year? Should they avoid it? How do you figure that out? It's on a case by case basis, really. There might be some children who want to show up at the parade because they feel it's a part of welcoming in the new year and they want to be part of the community. And there might be others that are more tentative and worried. And I think each child's position should be respected. Uh, I think it's fair for parents to have their child evaluated by a professional to see what makes the most sense for them, um, but to continue the conversation so that they feel they have a voice in controlling aspects of their life. Because part of post-traumatic stress disorder is really the sense that the world is out of control and you could be a victim at any time. And part of working through the emotional process is finding the areas in life that you can take control over as you're working towards healing. Yeah, what a tragedy on many levels for, for the children who were victims and survived or the ones who witnessed all this, if in fact the spirit and the joy of the season is somehow stolen from them. And, and I hope they're getting the help that they need, and, I'm, and I trust they are, because there's really good people in Waukesha. Dr. Robbie Ludwig is going to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the defendant, the accused, uh, Darrell Brooks, representing himself. During jury selection, a lot of blurting out, a lot of um, things you don't normally see in the courtroom. So what happened and what can the judge do? We'll talk about that when we come back. And safely be you. consenting to anything you say until you can answer the questions that I'm asking. I'm not going to let you intimidate me into believing Mr. something. Mr. Brooks, I'm not, not intimidating you. Because you, you can't. And you see that. Unbelievable moments inside that courtroom where you've got uh, Daryl Brooks, who's on trial for mass murder, representing himself and talking back to the judge. Let's bring back in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's in Waukesha, Wisconsin tonight. Uh, Chanley, let's start first with, um, it was the jury selection process. Did we get a jury? I know there's a lot of chaos today. There was after two arduous days of jury selection with that defendant representing himself. Over the disruptions, we finally did have a jury seated tonight. Just moments ago, it was a jury of 10 men and six women were seated. They've already been instructed by the judge. Uh, these are a group of jurors with 
12 with four alternates. Four will be alternates. All appear to be white, Vinny. And it was, again, a process that took a couple of days, and they were seated over the defendant's objections. He, had, he made continuing objections to strike the panel of jurors that was continually overruled. And now we have this jury seated. He did exercise two of his possibly 10. He had a, up to 10 peremptory strikes. He did exercise two of those earlier today, but then, of course, began to be disruptive. Uh, but that's where we are. Now, this jury, again, instructed now they will return on Thursday, Vinny. All right, Jay, let, let's, let's get back to the defendant now, representing himself, had to be removed from court again today because it happened yesterday. He sort of had a timeout in the middle of the day, was, was put somewhere else. What happened today? Right, and yesterday he was told that he could return back inside the courtroom because he behaved so well, but less than 30 minutes this morning, Vinny, he was kicked out again and removed to a, another courtroom where he watched the proceedings via video, and you can see him via Zoom inside the courtroom where the jurors were. He spent most of the day muted, and you can see him gesticulating passionately, speaking to somebody in that other room. Uh, at times, he would sit with his head down on the desk, and then when he had an opportunity to return to the courtroom, he refused. In fact, after lunch, I was in there, and him and the judge started uh, to fight again, if you want to call it that, and he refused to return back into the courtroom. He wanted to go into that remote room and watch from there. Uh, so it was very uh, contentious between him and the judge again. Uh, but that's, yeah, so he... It will be seen if, when this trial starts, Vinny, if he'll actually be in the courtroom or somehow be remote again as he's trying to give his opening or cross-examining any of the witnesses. But tomorrow, uh, there is no court. The jury will return on Thursday. They're going to take some housekeeping matters up in the afternoon, though. All right. I want to I take a look at, at some of the um, antics from today. Let's, let's watch it. Can the title man please direct the prosecutor to answer whether there are assessment for the charges Mr. Brooks, in her possession? No one's going to be answering these questions, okay? I'm not requiring the state to do that. I'm advising you to stop asking those questions. Request, it will uh, be considered an interrupt. He's interrupted. I Take him to the next courtroom. All right, that's some sort of a preview of what may be in store. So speaking about what's in store, what is next? What's, what's happening next here? Well, tomorrow we'll, we'll have those housekeeping matters taken up, no jury. But that jury of 16 returns on Thursday for opening statements. Then they will be instructed first. Then openings will take place. And then the prosecution, the judge said, for them to be prepared to call their first uh, witnesses to the stand. They have 300 witnesses listed on that witness list. The defense, interesting, before, of course, Brooks took over, pro se, had three defense witnesses listed, including his mother, Vinny. But today, Brooks informed the judge that he no longer plans to call his mother. So we will see once that unfolds. Wow. All right, Chanley Painter in Waukesha, Wisconsin, getting ready for this trial starting up tomorrow. Thank you so much. Uh, let's bring back in our guest still with us, a psychotherapist, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. And joining me now in Detroit, Michigan, retired judge, good friend of mine, the Honorable Vonda Evans. Uh, great to see everyone. Uh, judge, great to see you. Let me start with you, Judge. What would you do or what can the judge do to control someone like this defendant? Let me say this to you. It's good seeing you again. Absolutely. But let, when you're in a situation like this, experience kicks in. What the judge is trying to do is to respect his rights and still be friendly with him. You can't do that. You're going to have to assert your control over him and say, listen, Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to have any more of that. If you want to participate in this trial, you will stay in the uh, sequestered area with a video. And you don't let him back out. You make him stay there and you take control of this situation. I'm not trying to say that she's not in control. It's experience. You know, that comes with 22 years on the bench. You almost have to treat them as grown children and take control of the situation. She's trying to respect him with passion and dignity, and that's not working with him. You know, uh, Judge, as you were saying that, I saw Dr. Robbie nodding her head. Go yes. ahead. No, I completely agree. I mean, here you have this person who's completely manic and dysregulated. He is completely out of control. As 
the defendant's mother said, this man is manic and he's irritable, he's disruptive, he enjoys not listening. This is his yes. show, according to him. And um, he's gonna be as disruptive and argumentative as he wants to be. Here is someone who was completely unknown to the world. Now the world is watching him. I have control. I have someone who is trying to treat me like an adult. And guess what? I'm going to take full advantage of it and I'm going to be disruptive. What do I have to lose? He knows that if convicted, he's going to have natural life. So guess what? This is his stage and he's taking control. The judge is going to have to take him out that courtroom, put him in a room with a video so that he can hear it and see it and sit him down. That's what you have to do in certain, in certain in situations like that. I have a lot of respect for her. She's a relatively new judge. I'm not saying that she doesn't have control. I'm saying that there's a certain way that you have to treat individuals like that. And she's trying to re treat them with respect and he's out of control. All right. And he's manipulating. Yeah, manipulating. Uh, absolutely. All right, uh, Dr. Robbie. Judge Von Evans staying with us when we come back. Uh, something else I want to cover about this trial, the fact that he's representing himself, which means he gets to question the witnesses, which include victims in the case. How does the judge control that? What's it going to be like? We'll talk about that. Plus, coming up next hour. In Pike County, Ohio, the Pike County Massacre case, four members of the Wagner family accused of taking out eight members of the Roden family in a child custody dispute. Shocking testimony today from the ex-daughter-in-law of Angela Wagner, painting a picture of some really disturbing, odd behavior. Every night before we went to bed, I would be made to go take a nap while Angela played with my son. It was a holiday parade that quickly turned tragic. Evil has arrived and it's shown what it can do. Darrell Brooks is accused of killing six people when he drove his vehicle through a crowd of spectators. In a surprising move, Brooks waived his right to an attorney and instead will be representing himself. Our cameras will be inside the courtroom as a community searches for justice. The Deadly Parade Crash Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, 9, 8 central. Only on Court TV Care. I'm Chenley Painter in Waukesha, Wisconsin for the Deadly Parade Crash Trial. And this is CORE TV, your front row seat to justice. Mr. Brooks, we have to continue with this hearing. I'm not worried about me. Don't put your hand on me, dude. Nobody put their hands on you. Yeah, they better not put their hand on me. Okay, Mr. Brooks, you need to look at me for a minute, okay? Why? The missing all this political stuff y'all got going on? Mr. Brooks, I'm more concerned hey, about... Don't touch me, uh, dog. Stay seated. Stay seated. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back after lunch. I'm not going to do this with him right now. He needs to be here. He's not cooperating. I'm going to give you the warning, Mr. Mr. Brooks. I will give you the warning that if you continue to interrupt when we, when we go back on the record, you will forfeit your right to be in the courtroom today. I can't have these interruptions. I want you here. It's been a long day and a half. Put your hands off me. We'll come back at, at 12.30. That man is representing himself. That man is representing himself. That was at a, a pretrial hearing, um, and this trial beginning on Thursday, opening statements, cross-examination of witnesses, including surviving victims. There's like more than 60 of them that survived. There's like 300 people on the witness list. What is this going to be like inside the courtroom? Still with us, Dr. Robbie Ludwig and the Honorable Vonda Evans, retired judge out of Detroit, Michigan. Um, let me ask you, Judge, he's representing himself, constitutional right, we understand that. It's his choice, be it, may, what, it, what, it what it is. But that also means he will have the opportunity to question, is there any way the judge can protect witnesses? And, and specifically, I'm talking about, you're gonna have some young witnesses in this case very young witnesses who were victims in this. 
In my opinion, she's going to have to take control early. She is going to have to leave him in a room where there is an opportunity for them, the witnesses, to see him and for him to see them and to ask them questions like we're doing now. And that's it. Got to keep him out of the, you're saying keep him out of the courtroom. When there's Keep witnesses. him out the courtroom, period. Because let me explain what happens. When he does that, he doesn't get the attention that he desires. And as a result, then he starts to act like, you know, he's calmer. But the minute you bring him in and he knows it is televised, he starts to act up. Why? Because he wants the attention. Keep him out the courtroom. Dr. Robbie, how do we protect these, these, these victims who are going to testify? Yeah, I, I love you, Judge. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. He needs someone like you that can't be manipulated. And it's the cameras that's really charging him up. I mean, in his mind, he's a lawyer, he's a star, he's a reality show person. And if he doesn't have the cameras, there is no show. And I think he needs to be threatened with that. You continue, and we're going to do this with no cameras. And maybe that would help him stay in line. I don't know legally if you can threaten, if you don't stop this, we are going to get an attorney for you. I don't know if that can be done. But he's like a little tantrumy child who believes he's right. He's out of control because he's not medicated correctly. And you're, you're seeing his entitlement and grandiosity. So he needs to be in danger of losing something. And right now, it's the cameras that he doesn't want to lose. So that needs to be on the table. Uh, judge, let me, go ahead, Judge. Let me, say, let me say this. Three things that she has to make a finding for. Number one, he wants to be pro se, acting as his own attorney. Number two, that he, she advises him of the dangers. And number three, she has to make a final requirement that the defendant acting as his own counsel will not disrupt, unduly inconvenience or burden the court or the administration of the court's business. She has to find that. If she decides, listen, the third and final element, it's too disruptive to the administration of justice, she can bring a court appointed attorney in only to be able to uh, assist him. But he has an absolute right. She's got to take him out of that courtroom. You know, Dr. Robbie, when he had lawyers before, you know, like last week, and he fired them and decided to represent himself, the defense was an insanity defense. Can you believe it? Um, he's working towards that. He wants to prove and act that he's an insane guy because going to a hospital, a forensic hospital, is better than going to a prison. But he's not in his right state of mind. He doesn't have clarity of thought. He's just being impulsive in the moment and not working uh, on his own behalf in the best possible way. So I would believe anything, but I think he's he's like a frustrated actor who's now using this time to present how he wants to present and convince people how he wants to convince people. But the grandiosity is forcing his judgment to be off because what he wants and thinks he's doing, he's not doing at all. Judge Vonda, we have about 20 seconds. I'll give you the final word on this tonight. She's got to take control and she's got to be able to, you know, handle him because if not, if this is going to be a fiasco and that's what he wants. Thank you so much for having me on. Great to see you. Judge Vonda Evans, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, we'll see you again uh, real soon. Appreciate your time and your insight tonight.